If you've ever broken a drill on the lathe and thought, what I really need is a scanning electron microscope. Well, this is the video for you. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. I get comments all the time asking how on earth I know so much about so many different things. Some people ask about my formal training, but really that's a little bit off topic. It would be more accurate to describe me as an autodidact which literally means self-taught, but more generally means that I seek out knowledge on my own, directed by whatever shiny thing catches my interest. I do have a formal degree and it pays the bills, but most of what's in my head got there because I was curious. A couple of weeks ago, I saw a video about PCB design techniques to reduce electromagnetic interference. My curiosity got the better of me and I now have three textbooks on the subject that I'm reading. Last week, I broke a drill and thought it looked a little bit weird, and that's how we got on the path we're going down today. This is the drill in question. This is an M42 cobalt drill from Drill Hog. This is actually a split point grind. The first thing I noticed when I look closely at this is that it's broken, and, but aside from that, it just broke into two pieces. I've had drills shatter before, and usually you get a whole bunch of pieces. This just split right down the center, but not starting at the split point where I would have expected it to be the weakest, it split a little bit off center from that. This all happened in the lathe while I was drilling in aluminum. I was enlarging a pre-drilled hole and the drill suddenly just jammed and spun the chuck. And when I finally got it wrenched back out of the workpiece, it was broken just like you see it here. Like I said, I've never seen a drill fail like this, but here it is. I sent photos of the failed drill to Drill Hog, and they're sending me a replacement, no questions asked. You gotta love a lifetime warranty. But they also said that they don't recommend enlarging existing holes because the drill will almost always fail. That's news to me. I've always pre-drilled holes, anything over about three-eighths of an inch, especially on a small machine, but feel free to weigh in the comments and let me know if I'm wrong. Is that not standard shop practice? In any case, the drill's covered under warranty, so I'm not worried about that, but the way it failed kind of piqued my interest. Not only does it seem unusual to me that it cleaved off a single piece, but also if you look at the fracture surface, there are two different colors here. The color out here at the tip is dark and kind of brownish, and then back up at the root of the fracture, you can see that it's sort of this silver gray color and the texture is different as well. Now, the color here at the end, I can't help but notice looks very similar to the color on the outside of the drill. These are not coated drills. This is just uh, bare metal, but it's been oxidized as a part of the heat treating process. And so I'm starting to think that maybe this drill was already cracked and the inside of the crack was exposed to oxygen during the heat treating process. So it has that same gold colored oxidation that's on the outside of the drill. It's really hard to tell just looking at it. We need more magnification. Under a digital soldering microscope that I have in the shop, we can see the texture here a little bit better. You can see the end of the drill that's got that dark color on it, and we can clearly see the dividing line to the brighter gray colored fracture surface. And not only can we see the color difference, you can see that the texture is very different. The dark area has these longitudinal ridges in the break that are moving lengthwise down the drill. And then once we get down into this lighter colored portion of the break, you can see the surface texture is very different. It's very grainy, has lots of little ridges and secondary cracking in it. This has all the hallmarks of a brittle fracture. You can see these minor little additional cracks going down into the material, and you don't really see that up here in this darker portion. So that's even more evidence that the actual fracture mechanism was different, the condition of the material was different, and boy, at this magnification, it really does look like that is an oxide. You can see the materials broken here, but then you can see down in all of the little crevices that same gold color that's on the outside of the drill. There is some aluminum kind of smeared in here for obvious reasons, but yeah, the contrast just could not be greater between those two fracture surfaces. So I think it's really clear that these happened at different times. Unfortunately, this is the extent of the magnification I have available in the shop here. We can't really tell much more than just what we can see optically, and we don't really have a good way to tell what that brown color actually is. 
sure would be great if we had some better tools. As luck would have it, I know where I can find a scanning electron microscope and a friendly material science engineer who knows how to use it. If you're not familiar with how a scanning electron microscope works, you can just go to Wikipedia and read all about it. That's what I did. Essentially, a scanning electron microscope is a vacuum chamber where you place a sample and then a gun that scans a beam of electrons across that sample to image it. With an ordinary optical microscope, the photons will either bounce off the front of the sample or are transmitted through the sample, but with a scanning electron microscope, the electrons interact down within the surface of the sample. So the primary electron beam hits the sample, and then there's a teardrop region within the material where secondary electrons are emitted or electrons are backscattered out of it or electrons are knocked around in the orbitals of the atoms, causing them to emit different kinds of X-rays or other electromagnetic radiation. And that can allow the scanning electron microscope to both produce an image, but also to identify some of the properties of the sample. For example, a primary electron can come in and just knock an electron back out. And so you get a secondary electron you can get backscattered electrons where a primary electron comes in and just gets rejected back out. And you can also have a situation where a primary electron knocks a secondary electron out, but then an electron from a higher orbital will drop in and then emit some energy as X-rays. And that, again, helps you to identify materials in the sample. The microscope typically has multiple detectors. You have a backscatter detector that's usually an annular ring around where the electron beam comes out. That catches backscatter electrons that come straight back. And then you have electron detectors off to the side and X-ray detectors and other kinds of current detectors that will catch electrons that are coming out at low angles or X-rays coming out of the sample or just the current being conducted through the sample and all of this information can be used to create an image. The sample is loaded onto a little conductive platform that can then conduct the electrons away so that the sample doesn't charge up and can also be used to measure the current that's flowing through the sample from the electrons absorbed by it. In this case, we just took the broken piece of the drill bit, put it on the platform, and then taped it down with some conductive tape and then place that into the vacuum chamber of the electron microscope. And you can see the microscope has an XY stage here and it has the ability to tilt the sample back and forth because the electron beam is always coming directly down from the top. So if you wanna image different portions of the sample or if you want to image from different angles, you can move this around robotically inside the vacuum chamber. With the sample loaded into the microscope and a vacuum drawn on the chamber, we have several views here. We have an optical camera inside that shows the sample sitting on the platform. You've got the main electron beam coming out here, and you've got various detectors around the sides, including, I think, detectors in this tip. Don't quote me on this. I'm not an expert in this, but I do think it's pretty cool. Then over here on the left, we have our targeting image that shows us where we're actually looking. In this case, there's a green crosshair here. We're looking at this portion of the drill. And then up top here, we have two images. And these images are coming from different detectors. The image here on the left is from the T1 detector, which is an annular ring located around the source where the beam is coming out. So it's catching electrons that are being scattered directly back. And then over here on the right, we have an ET or an Everhart Thornley detector. This detector, I believe, is off to the side, so it's catching secondary electrons that are coming out of the side of the sample at a low angle, and you can see you get a different kind of an image. In the case of the backscattered electrons here coming directly back into the T1 detector, we have a very flat image that doesn't show a lot of the detail of the surface texture where with the detector off to the side, we get a much better idea of the 3D surface of the sample. Let's take a look at our sample here. Now, keep in mind, I am not an expert in this, but I will try to relay what I understand about it. And you can feel free, if you are an expert in this, to put more information or your interpretation of this down in the comments. I'd love to see it. We're gonna start by looking at the clean silver portion of the break here. These crosshairs are the center of where we're looking at the sample. 
and this is 5,000 times magnification. Now you can see a few things here. These little individual nodules are individual phases, or those are individual elements that are present that are in uh, little clumps in the material. This is normal, as I understand it, in a metal alloy. This isn't an issue. This isn't a failure of mixing. This is totally normal at this level of magnification. Those little nodules are probably tungsten, but it's difficult to tell. Now, when you look at this sample, the morphology of it or the shape of the break tells you some things about it. You'll note there are lots of little facets here, and there's not a lot of stretching or pulling. There's not a lot of rounded surfaces. There's not a lot of cupping here. This looks like this material was broken between the grains, and that is characteristic of a brittle failure, meaning that the material was hard when this was broken, and the break and the failure was sudden. It propagated through the material. There wasn't any stretching or giving of the material. It just fractured. And that is consistent with the hypothesis that this part of the material was solid. The material is very hard. This is a cutting tool, and it fractured while it was cutting. Now let's take a look a little further up here on the sample in the dark area. This is the area that I am speculating was cracked from the factory and oxidized previously. And as you can see, the structure of the sample here is very different. Instead of having a lot of flat surfaces, there are a lot of rounded surfaces and a lot of little round pockets with little stretched out edges that pulled, deformed, and then snapped off. And you can see that the material around these phases is pulled away from it. The little voids in the material have coalesced as the material stretched out, you know, towards the camera in this view, and then ultimately snapped off. This is characteristic of a ductile failure, which means that the material deformed before it finally broke. It kind of stretched and pulled away from these phases and then ultimately snapped off. That would be consistent with this occurring while the material was hot as a part of the manufacturing process. And that would be consistent with this cracking. I really don't know how the blanks for these drills are manufactured. I don't know how the heat treating process works, but this would be consistent with a crack forming during a forging process or during the heat treating process. So based on this analysis, I think the portion here that is light silver gray broke when the material was cold and the dark area of the break probably occurred when the material was hot and soft. Of course, the images created by the electron microscope are black and white, and that's because we're not using light, so there is no color. We're just shooting electrons into the sample and collecting the energy that comes back out. So it's not possible to see the difference in these images between the light and dark areas of the sample. Fortunately, the scanning electron microscope has another trick up its sleeve for identifying the materials that are present. If you take a look at this periodic table of the elements that came with the detector in this microscope, you can see these principal lines that are called out for each element, and these relate to the energy level of the x-rays that will be produced when this atom is scanned. And every element has a unique set of characteristic energy levels, so the microscope can then use this information to try to identify which materials are present in the sample. The detector is mounted in the side of the vacuum chamber, and then in the software you just select an area of the sample that you would like to analyze, and while the electron beam is scanning through that region, it collects and analyzes the energy coming back out of it, and then builds a histogram here across the bottom to try to identify what materials are present. In this particular case, we've identified a bunch of things, carbon, oxygen, vanadium, chromium, molybdenum, tungsten. These are all things that we would expect to see. The tool steel should have carbon, chromium, tungsten, molybdenum, vanadium, and cobalt. And we see most of those here. Uh, one thing that is really strange about this particular sample is there's way, way, way too much carbon. It's saying there's more carbon in the surface than iron. And that's probably because this part of the sample is contaminated. And it's probably contaminated with cutting oil, which is primarily a mineral oil, which is a hydrocarbon. And so it's probably reading carbon from the oil that's on the sample. 
After fishing around for a while to try to find a clean area on the sample, this is the spectrum that we got. And this is from the bright silver portion of the break that we speculate was new, so was not oxidized. And we see pretty much what we would expect. Chromium, vanadium, cobalt, tungsten, everything here is exactly what we ex should expect from a clean sample. Notably, there's no oxygen detected. The golden oxide layer on the outside of the drill should contain oxygen. And so in the clean silver portion of the break, there shouldn't be any. Our hypothesis being that this portion was broken while I was using the drill and this dark area was broken during manufacture. So let's go take a look at the spectrum in that dark area. The spectrum in the dark area looks almost exactly the same, except for right here. This little O is oxygen. There is oxygen present here. It's something like six to 8%. And in fact, if we overlay the two samples on top of each other, that is really the only difference, that little bump showing the oxygen. So what does that tell us? It tells us that this is indeed an oxide coating. It's not some other kind of coating. It's nothing else deposited because the elemental analysis of this matches except for the oxygen. So all that is, is that's just an oxidized area on the drill. And in fact, if you move over and take a sample from the parts that should have been on the exterior of the drill, it matches exactly. Well, I think that just about settles it. We can say with some confidence that this drill had a crack in it that formed during manufacturing and it finally split while I was using it on the lathe. Mystery solved. What do we do with this information? Nothing. Drills are consumables. I'll just replace it and move on with my life. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe, leave me a comment, and maybe think about supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects and get a little peek behind the scenes. Also, if you're a company that makes scanning electron microscopes and you want to talk about a sponsorship deal, thank you for watching.